In the northwestern United States, a group of engineers was about to monitor the first flight of Boeing's newest airliner. There was a lot at stake. Boeing hoped that this plane, the 777, would assure the success of the company into the 21st century. It had taken 10,000 people nearly four years to design and build the plane using the latest technology, including two of the largest engines on any airliner in the world. But the plane had never left the ground. John Cashman, the chief test pilot, would take the 777 into the air for the first time if all went well. First flights are always risky. There are only two people on board, the pilots, who both carry parachutes. On the ground, all the chief engineers were on hand to help if the plane developed problems with any of its systems or structures. Among the people with the most at stake were Phil Condit, president of the Boeing Company, and Alan Mulally, leader of the engineering team, who had lived and breathed the plane for more than five years. Okay, Crown, you can disconnect, give us hand signals and clear. Thanks for the help. Roger, and have a good flight. Everything had been done that could be done to make this day a success. But in spite of his jovial backslapping, Alan Mullally would not be happy until his plane had taken off and landed successfully. The weather was one concern. There were strong winds and low clouds out over the Pacific, the route they were planning to fly. tailwind for starting yeah. the engine right but these engines these engines uh, are just performing better than everybody expected so usually we'd have to turn the airplane around you know have the engine blow into it and uh, Kenny and John said no problem it started right up had a good yeah start. had a good start real yeah. good start our lives to make the best airplane in the world and to see that come together uh, I want to make sure that I didn't uh, I didn't fully appreciate uh, that accomplishment Did you think it was pretty? <laughs> Let's get the order book out The flight was due to last three hours while Cashman and his co-pilot Ken Higgins headed west over the Pacific VIPs, triple seven team members and journalists waited on the ground Expecting our first in flight briefing coming up in just a few minutes. Well, it's okay. I don't, I don't know. Know. Come on, you. Know. Of course, at least. 
We've been running uh, integration tests. 1000億円以上を負担するほど、民間機の開発では最大のプロジェクトプロジェクトと言われています。For those who may be interested in hearing about the status of the flight, let me just introduce to you Captain Jim McRoberts. He is our chief pilot for flight test. The first flight took place before the eyes and ears of the world's press in what was one of Boeing's biggest PR operations to date. Speed limit. Uh, you can see there under the operations column, he evaluated the handling qualities and he did pulses, which are little uh, wiggles of the wheel. The pilot's radio messages were relayed to the press conference, although they could be instantly cut off if any problem arose. They're doing things today that you would norm normally never do on a first flight, like cycle a gear a lot, shut down an engine and relight it, and uh, do all this extensive series of stall tests you know, with all these flap settings, and they've cycled all the flight control systems. And sometimes you can be very cautious on a first flight, leave the gear down, do a slow speed flight just to check what your landing speed is going to be, and then come back. But today they're, they're spending three hours doing virtually what you would do on a, if you were well into the test program. In fact, things went so well that it was three and a half hours before the plane headed back to Seattle. Feet and ring. Okay, that one's complete. Okay, now get the whole wing, including the engine. We'll take it from about here. Okay. They're going to taxi in and park right over here on the Boeing ramp. They'll be greeted by um, Frank Schrantz. Presents. <laughs> Presents. They just got to fly for three hours. There they are. There they are out there. <laughs> yes, because of, I think it's because the back one's behind. It makes it look that way. Yep. Oh, look how stable it is. Flight test. Oh my gosh. This guy's Far most productive day of flight test ever. Dude, you too. He On the most important day of his professional life, Alan Mullally still found time to marshal the press. We want to get everybody kind of uh, out of the way so that the media can get as good a, a shot as we can, OK? And here's what we're going to do. Um, Frank and Phil and I are going to go out to the, Ron are going to go out to the bottom. Frank's going to say hello. And then we're going to have their families come out and meet them at the bottom so you can get that too. Then I'll bring them over here, okay? I'll bring them right to here, and then you can ask all the questions, okay? Okay? Okay. Am I a team player or what? Yes. Okay. <laughs> if we Where you been? <laughs> Now, I'm going to put that. We don't need to do that. There we go. How do they get it down? 
Careful, Frank. <laughs> okay, Frank, stay back. Yeah, it's Congratulations, great. And you did a great, great job. Right. Yeah, Kenny, we're good. We're great. that's great. Terrific. We Happy really day, and you really Come made it up. for all of us. Congratulations, Mary. <laughs> Congratulations. Fantastic. What a day, huh? There's some beef for a <laughs> 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 really fantastic. We are commenting to Frank that we've flown production airplanes that have been made for several years that are not as good shape as this airplane. I'm really pleased that, you know, that none, none at all. What was the highlight? <laughs> the landing. <laughs>In the weeks after the first flight of the 777, there were several more first flights for the next few planes to come off the assembly line. when you see the data starting to come out and it it's always falling on the good side that's that's really encouraging and it handles very nicely engines have been outstanding I really have I don't worry about the engines at all we've had uh, we've done a number of tests with engines shut down I mean even from first flight we we had enough confidence on that test to shut the engine down the first time We've flown, uh, I believe, six hours and 50 minutes now with one engine shut down, mm -hmm. continuous, and then climb back to altitude and shut it down again for another three hours. So from that standpoint, the, I think the flying test bed and the conditions that, that we exposed it to there, the uh, high altitude chamber at the Arnold Engineering Development Center, all of that work that went into it has really paid off. But in spite of Cashman's cheerfulness, things hadn't gone entirely according to plan. Whenever the nose landing gear doors closed at speed, there was a violent buffeting. This malfunction appeared during the first flight and was an actual design problem rather than a fault with that particular aircraft because the same problem occurred as the second and third planes took their first flights. The team set to work on a solution. They eventually constructed metal plates called baffles in the nose gear well to disrupt the airflow. The problem disappeared. Then a new problem occurred. On an early test flight, a skin panel came off and sliced into the hydraulic lines that moved the landing gear. They'd already had a problem with locking the landing gear. This made it worse. The failure occurred when the gear was starting to come up. Uh, and it was the process of the landing gear coming up uh, at high speed that led to a vibration that caused this door to come loose. And then flopping around, it cut a hydraulic line. After that occurred, we, we knew that the landing gear would probably not lock in the place, and we knew already how to make it lock. So I did this little maneuver rolling the airplane a little bit, and the gear popped in, and it was fine. The Seattle newspapers, with their close interest in Boeing, were quick to report the event. It was the latest in a series of news stories that had highlighted problems the plane had had during testing. And I'm sure for the press, it's hard to understand that that failures of any kind are acceptable. Yet, to us, at this stage of the game, that's success. When people take that information and blow it out of proportion or misinterpret it or try to make a creative, dramatic story out of it, I get frustrated because it's, 
it's not a it, it uh, I view it as somewhat of an attack on the pilot community, but also it, it's sort of a, a break in the trust that I think should exist in both directions. At the same time, I understand that, that it's a different world to most people. They relate to what these things would mean in the airline world with them flying as a passenger. And, and it's a totally different environment. We're, we're looking for different things. And the goal is to solve the problems before we ever get to the airline world. But the biggest problem was the plane's electronics. From the start, the 777 was designed to be flown by an entirely computerized system of electronic controls that would guide the plane's movements. Pretty wild ride there for a little bit. But there was also a whole range of other electronics in the plane, also run by computers, as people vied with each other to think up new things for the plane's systems to do. It even took Boeing by surprise. The first time that I remember being in conversations about it was associated with this inf the managing information. And I can remember wondering what they were talking about. And you know, senior leaders of the airlines were telling us about, well, maybe we should have all of the uh, maintenance information about an airplane on the airplane. Because the airplane goes around the world and stops at remote locations. So rather than to try to get the airplane back to the maintenance base, why don't you just take the maintenance manual with the airplane and all of the records with it and how you repair it and the repair manual. And then the entertainment side uh, started to reveal itself to the airlines. And I think it all happened with, as a, as a part of the evolution of digital technology and the entertainment business and CD-ROMs and, and PCs at home and, and all of us managing this uh, more functionality and more capability and, because uh, it can be done. Fly-by-wire electronic controls were not new. Airbus pioneered the system in their newest planes, but the 777 would use new methods of data transfer and more computing power. Boeing built an entirely new laboratory to test and run the computer systems on the ground to ensure that the safety of the plane was not jeopardized by the technology. They sought to minimize the consequences of computer failure by having as many as nine computers in situations where one would do. And because they were stepping cautiously into a new era, they gave the pilot the last word on many of the control decisions. But the task was unprecedented. We have had to create in one small package, namely an airplane, a very large amount of computer instructions. The way we measure these is by what we call lines of computer code. Think of those as a sentence to a computer. This airplane has over two million lines of such sentences which are created uniquely for this airplane. Uh, other comparable systems like uh, the uh, air traffic system that's being redone for the United States, that's 1.6 million lines of code. A modern uh, military fighter has about a million and a half lines of computer code in it for its flight systems and its fire control systems. A, I know that a submarine warfare aircraft that has all kinds of radar systems, and it's about a million and a half lines. So in that regard, the 777 was a very substantial undertaking in terms of the amount of new computer programs and, and lines of instructions that had to be done. The 777 was a plane whose computing power was dominated by the electronic services that the airlines wanted for their passengers. But the passenger entertainment system computers were many months behind schedule even though subcontractors in the U.S. and Britain were working overtime to find the bugs. No one had really understood at the beginning of the project how much computing power the system would consume. The kinds of systems that BA and United will be flying, they're entertainment systems. There's actually more computer code for the passenger entertainment than there is for doing the original job of the aircraft, which is carrying people from point to point. The passenger entertainment systems had their own dedicated laboratory where there was a full mock-up of the 777 cabin. The plane would have a multi-channel video screen, a telephone, and a computer in every seat. To some, it seemed like a lot of effort to provide something many passengers wouldn't even want or need. Even Alan Mulally didn't see himself as ever using all the electronics. I've always loved sleeping on airplanes, but maybe that's a... Uh, problem I have. I like to sleep. <laughs> well, I can get a chance to sleep. I love 
reading uh, uh, books. And the other day I was on an airplane and I, it was a pretty long flight and I woke up having had a wonderful time on this flight and I, I uh, noticed that my colleague was still awake and looked like he'd been awake for a long time and I asked him how his flight went and he thought it was great. He'd watched three movies, he'd played uh, interactive bridge, played um, some checkers, uh, bought some things for his uh, wife on the home shopping channel, he was going to pick it up at the airport and he thought he had a great time. I was glad I was me and I was glad he was he. Or even him. Or him, yeah. <laughs> As the rest of the plane and its systems followed a schedule that took them nearer to the delivery date, the plane's computers just got further and further behind. United wanted to show off the plane at its best from the moment it went into service, so United's Gordon McKenzie grew increasingly worried. I'd say the trickiest part of it is, is when we start getting into some real agony over some of our suppliers. We're trying to work the supplier issue, our, our buyer furnished equipment, which is people supplying equipment on United's contract that they then turn over to Boeing. Trying to get Boeing to work with us and the supplier to, to do a three-way uh, successful completion of the job. That's been very, very interesting. Uh, still a real development struggle to get all that stuff put together and delivered on time. That struggle would continue to worry United. Only a concentrated period of testing would show whether the team had built the systems correctly and gotten rid of all the bugs. The first five planes to come off the assembly line were being used as test aircraft, although four of them would later be refurbished and handed over to the airlines when the tests were completed. The first plane that would fly in scheduled service was given the number WA-6, the sixth to come off the production line. While all the attention had been focused on the test planes, WA-6 was moving through the factory toward its delivery date. It was the first of 34 planes ordered by United, which also had an option on 34 more. At every stage, United's representatives roamed through the factory, inspecting the results and highlighting any problems. When contracts were signed, Boeing had guaranteed to United that the plane would not exceed a maximum agreed upon weight. By test weighing an unfinished plane, Boeing had some idea of how well they were doing, but the only test that would satisfy United was weighing an actual finished plane. This event was the culmination of years of design work, all aimed at making good on the guarantee to United. Airlines want lighter planes because they can carry more passengers for the same amount of fuel per flight. But getting the total weight right by calculating the weights of more than three million individual parts is hardly an exact science. Uh, normally, uh, depending on the model of airplane, uh, the variation from model to model that theoretically are identical uh, can be as much as a quarter to a third of a percent. Uh, you'd say, well, gee, how can that be? Well, it, it, it just is. I mean, there's, there's, if you think about it, there's uh, 100,000 parts that come together or so to make up an airplane, and every one of those parts has a little bit of variation in them. Or my ability or our ability uh, uh, to, to understand what's in that airplane as it, it, the airplane's rolling down the line. And so we found that there can be that much variation uh, in that just from model to model to model. That's why we're very interested in understanding it. If you will, it's a measure of our capability here at the Boeing Company to produce airplanes. They added together readings from several weighing pads, but this was like trying to weigh a person on two different scales at once. This is the nose wheel of our air airplane, and then scale A and scale B is where the two main gears would be sitting. If the plane was heavier than the guaranteed weight, Boeing could have to pay United up to $500 per plane per year for every pound overweight to compensate them for the fact that they would either have to carry less weight on board or burn more fuel. As the plane rested on the scales, Alan Bailey and his colleagues hoped that their estimates were not too far off. 
They'd calculated that the plane would weigh 297,500 pounds, but they weren't sure. For the uh, total readings, we had on the first one 297,464, 297,462, and 297,467. Right, so we're 36 pounds 36 off. 36 pounds off. You and I stay, we get to go <laughs> the right way. What would Mullally be doing? Oh, yeah. oh, he would be jumping yeah. up and down. Yeah, be, Trust me, I'll it call it. doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> I'm ecstatic. This is great. Yeah. This is and what this we're is waiting for. This is as happy as Gordon. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't get any happier than this. One of the most important systems for passenger comfort, the heating and air conditioning system, was being tested in a plane set aside for that purpose. It was put through its paces in a range of situations representing the extremes of temperature it was likely to experience during service. Sharon McDonald Schramm was the environment control engineer. Being both British and female, she was an elite member of two minorities at Boeing. For her, it was no problem. Really, I think some people are just naturally bossy, which I think I am, quite honestly. And I think that's one common thread. Most of the women engineers here, I think we do tend to be more forceful and whether it's because we're here because we are more forceful or we're more forceful because we're here, I, I'm really not sure. But because of that, we very often take the lead roles and, you know, it doesn't seem to be a problem at all. Um, being English actually does have some advantages because everyone tells me it makes us sound more intelligent. All the air used in the plane, hot or cold, would be taken from the engine and then spread through the plane to do a whole range of different jobs. Um, depending on what you want to do with that air, if I want to melt ice on the engine cowl, I would stay right there at the engine and go to the cowl of the engine and melt any ice which might have formed if we're in icing conditions. Um, as far as the air coming actually into the cabin, uh, we would come from the air supply system in through the air conditioning pack. Um, we would come through a whole series of ducting and then we have air supply grills um, which are above head height. The air would come out of the air supply grills and the way our flow pattern works is that it goes across into the middle of the cabin and then circles back round and we have a return air grill which is on the wall at about foot height so the air circulation comes back round. We have fans drawing the air through which helps the uniformity of the heat and then depending on whether this is some air that's going to be recirculated, um, we'd go through a filter, we have recirculation fans and then eventually the air gets exhausted out. We have outflow valves which let the air leave the airplane. To investigate airflow, the engineers puffed smoke into the inlets. We use smoke generators all the time. I mean, we, we should be 50 a day people at the rate we go. We use theatrical smoke generators primarily um, to watch the airflow patterns, and that's very successful. Um, the bad thing is, sometimes we actually have to use tobacco smoke, and that's very unpleasant, and we all go home smelling quite disgusting. At the peak of summer, the team flew south to Phoenix, Arizona, to test the plane's cooling systems. We're down here to do hot day testing, and literally until you get here with 107 degree temperatures, we're not quite sure what kind of temperatures we're going to see. Um, we did see some temperatures on some of our ducting that was a little higher than we'd expected, but we managed to take care of that and carry on testing. Um, we do a whole series of tests which are really for Boeing's benefit to make sure that we've you know, designed things correctly and everything works per the design. Uh, the certification tests that we do are for the FAA to make sure that the plane is you know, fully safe to fly. So yesterday was our first cert test and we passed the flying colors, so we're very happy about that. For the first four years of the 777 project, the 10,000-strong workforce had been led by Alan Mullally. More than anyone else, he had typified the open spirit of a new management philosophy, which made it all right for everyone to bring their problems out into the open, solving them as a team rather than keeping them a secret. I think the human spirit is a fabulous thing, and I think there are beautiful butterflies in all of us. And I think that we come with no baggage and no burdens and no limitations in our own minds. And I think the environment we're trying to create is that, that we'd have a a shared 
thought, a shared vision, a shared appreciation, a shared understanding of what it is we're really going to try to accomplish together. Now, Mulally had been offered a promotion that would take him away from the 777 project. He came in here one day in my office and said, uh, Ron, uh, this is what's being considered. He said, and asked me what I thought. And I was in shock. I said, what? He said, you're kidding. And I said, I'm not. And he said, you're kidding. And I said, nope, I'm not. And then we both looked at each other for a while, and then we said, it'll be OK. We'll figure out how to make it OK. It just didn't seem like the right time from a company point of view to pull the leader out and put him elsewhere. Now, the job that Alan has taken on, uh, in my opinion at the time, didn't seem to, to uh, rationalize taking him from this program because we just felt we needed that leadership. But it was kind of a shock thing, really, at the time. And, and my advice, and he asked for it, uh, was, Alan, I don't think this is right, and I don't think you should do this. Um, something I feel really good about is that we talked about that way before it ever happened. And not just me, but all of the members of our team. Because um, life's about change, and, and life's about being adaptable and and so we we tried not to make it a bigger deal than it than it uh, than it really is. Mulally's successor would be Dale Hogarty, who had been in charge of the manufacture of the plane. A quiet man from the American West, he had none of Mulally's natural charisma. Still, he had proven himself through the many months of manufacturing the plane. I'd be less than honest if I didn't tell you that there was a little fear and trepidation with, uh, with that, uh, but uh, a lot of relation, too. It, it's a unique experience to think about having been with this program from the outset and then get to be the boss. You know, I don't think that happens very often, and I, uh, that was really a marvelous feeling for me. As Mulally left the project, it almost seemed as if the worst of it was over. But ahead lay a series of critical tests that would determine how well the plane performed in the most extreme situations. The next tests took place at Edwards Air Force Base, about 100 miles from Los Angeles. It has a 15,000-foot runway, one of the longest in the world, with plenty of space for the more dangerous tests that the team was about to carry out. The first was called VMU, VMU stands for Velocity Minimum Unstick. And basically, it's a demonstration of the minimum speed that the airplane can lift off at. Uh, and it's, it's achieved by putting the tail on the ground, and that's basically the highest angle that the wing can make with the air on the ground. And it's to show, actually, um, that the airplane will fly. Very early jet transport, swept wing jets, uh, had a problem that you could do that and never get off. And there were several accidents in early jet history uh, that, that this was an outgrowth of. To make the most of stable weather conditions, these tests were scheduled to begin at dawn. To get the plane ready and complete the pre-flight checks, the test crew and pilots arrived at 4 a.m. The VMU test would help to define a safe minimum takeoff speed for future pilots. The wing generated the most lift at the sharpest angle to the ground, and the test would show how slow the plane could travel and still lift off. It would also help in a situation where a pilot had to take off suddenly at a sharper angle than planned to avoid an obstruction, for example.
During a dozen or more VMUs at a range of speeds and weights, the team gathered the data they needed. The base of the fuselage was protected from damage by a block of oak, replaced every few takeoffs as it wore away. Gross weight, 41 The next important series of tests was designed to see how well the plane braked on dry and wet runways. I guess this is where, Porter, you said you didn't want to jump right back into wet ones. You want to do a couple of dry ones first and then do the wet landings? Because the Southern California weather was so hot, water would evaporate, so the runway would be sprayed with a special liquid. John Cashman hadn't known about this and was concerned. Is there any chemical in the water you're spraying? Is it wet? Yeah, we have a protein. It's, it, what it is is animal blood and fats and stuff like that, but it's, it's no harm, and especially with the dilution that we'll have. But uh, I'm just, no, I wasn't worried about harm. Uh, but does it totally evaporate? Over a period of time. Yeah. It, what I'm wondering, not, guys, it, hey guys, let's just do this one time. Yeah, I'm just wondering. That's the thing, you know, I, I don't think that stuff's going to leave the runway. It may not leave it for a day. But I, I, so I just wonder if it has the animal protein in it. Yeah. You have to wait till the coyotes get out. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. What, uh, what's going to be the procedure with a hot break or a break fire or something like that? Yeah, what? Are, are you the outside ground ups? I'm it. Okay. The only guy should be talking would be you. If, if we have a fire, we come to a stop, and it's more than a grease fire, or, or it's enough of a grease fire that we need to shoot it. We have been accustomed to carbon fiber causing some flaring yeah. and maybe oil residue or something. We don't get excited, yeah. but we don't take no action unless you're designated. Okay. If, if it's really bad, I mean, we'll call, but for, at less otherwise advised, we'll go out the front. Um, if for some reason we don't want to blow a door out of the side, the next best way, I think, is out the cockpit, okay. using the escape rope out the cockpit. Then you're somewhat shielded by the forward fuselage. And when you get to the ground, you run like hell forward, down the center line of the airplane. You don't look around to see what's going on. Or you may get trampled by the pilots. It <laughs> <laughs> sounds like veneer, doesn't it? Yeah, no veneer. problem. And you may be alone on the air. No problem. <laughs> The liquid was sprayed on the runway in a wide band to provide a suitable landing target for the plane. After checking the slipperiness of the liquid, the engineers left the runway so the test could begin. Although the plane looked as if it was landing squarely in the middle of the wet patch, Cashman felt that something had gone wrong. The airplane went into the wetted area and it started to slide. And I tried to steer it back, but it was so slippery the nose gear didn't really bring me back. It, the nose gear didn't have any bite into the, to uh, provide a steering uh, change. So I, I had to use the rudder, the aerodynamic controls. And when I did that, uh, when that happens, that also causes the airplane to move sideways. And 
and so I put a little bit in and I got it aimed back the other way. And then I put another correction in and I'd hoped that wouldn't go out the other side. And I didn't and I got, managed to get it back on the center. But my feeling was we had gone off with the left wheels uh, slightly into the at least not totally wet area. Uh, and the data seems to, to indicate that might have been the case. The load on the brakes was changed before every test flight by adding or removing ballast. Cashman noted some key information in a place where he was sure he wouldn't lose it. I put, I put two numbers on it. The top number is the number of people on board. So in an emergency, you can notify a crash truck how many people are on board. This other number is what we call the zero fuel weight. That's basically the empty weight of the airplane uh, with the people on board. It's 382.5 in this case. So you, that number plus the fuel is the total weight of the airplane. Test followed test as the team alternated takeoffs and landings in escalating degrees of wetness. The plane had also been put through a series of spray tests that checked the effect of larger amounts of water on the engines and control surfaces. If water stayed in some of the crevices, it could freeze and jam the controls. Finally, the team met to prepare for the last and most dangerous test, the one they called the big one. It would be the first time the plane had used its carbon fiber brakes at maximum weight while going at maximum speed with maximum engine thrust. But the day before the test, John Cashman was worried. He had just heard that the test had to be done at a higher thrust rating, 88,000 pounds instead of 84. I'll tell you my concern. We'll talk about brakes here in a second, but we've done all this buildup at 84, which has given us the confidence that you guys can predict the distance to Excel 2, uh -huh. the cut speed. Yeah, the cut speed. Now we're changing to another level on an engine that's never been run above 84. Other engines have been run above 84, but these have not. Plus, we have an engine that's had 10 fuel cuts on it. And partway through this acceleration, I don't want to find out I have an engine problem. Because for whatever, I don't know how it got transferred, but we may have to fly in this, this condition. If something happens, we blow a tire before uh, cut speed, we're flying. So uh, we need an engine and a rating that will fly in the air. So that's, that's where I'm concerned, is we've done all this buildup, which builds confidence and gives you guys validation that you have a pretty good estimate. And now we're changing to a level that we don't know really anything about, right. or even if these engines will do it. The test plane had engines and brakes ordered by United Airlines. What troubled Cashman was the fact that a change had been made at the last minute to satisfy a guarantee made to British Airways, whose planes would have different engines and brakes. Why do we have to do this at all if it's not BA's brake? I'll tell you what I heard. I, what I've heard is that there was a contract entered into with the brake fenders, and Gray has not heard the same story, but uh, that we we're going to only produce one flight manual. So we'd only have one level of performance. So why do we just find this out on the day before we're going to do this test? Don't know the answer to that one. Hmm. Yeah. Because we should, all this buildup should have been done at this engine rating. Well, I, the story I heard is needs more energy for the GE engine. Yeah, but this isn't right now going to be on that airplane where the concern is. It may be on somebody else's, but... Right. I, to be honest with you, my worries are not what happens after I stop. If, if everything blows up 
at three knots, I don't care. I mean, I care, but <laughs> what I worry about is something happened before I stop and I go off the end. Right. If we're running on rims at that point, we may collapse the gear, and it would be pretty ugly. These guys, and I lump you all into one category, it was your collective bosses that started this whole thing. You don't seem to be particularly comfortable with it. Why don't you? You go, we can still have our pre-flight. This doesn't affect the pre-flight. Right, the pre-flight yeah. works the same either way. Why don't you go consult with your bosses and come back to us sometime this afternoon with a recommendation. Very good. In the meantime, we'll change the engine and we'll be ready and we can go either way. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> but I still may not do it. Yes. <laughs> I said a recommendation. The team needed to determine whether the test would require an unacceptable risk. First, they ran the engine to see how it performed at the higher thrust, and then they checked with the brake manufacturers to see if they had tested their brakes in the laboratory to the higher braking force. When these results were reported back to Cashman, he decided to go ahead with the test in spite of his reservations. Okay, very good. Any other comments? Very good. Okay, we'll tackle it tomorrow. Everybody sacrifice and... <laughs> you too, Jerry. Except the pilots. Sacrifice her. Except for the crew. Sacrificing was a Boeing tradition on the night before a really important test. There's somewhat of a tradition that uh, among the flight test personnel that if people don't go out and have quite a bit to drink the night before, the winds will not be favorable. And sometimes it actually seems to work, so... Anything that works on the winds, we're willing to accept. This way. This counts. The flight test team liked nothing better than to relax with a beer, a hamburger, and videos of plane crashes from the past. Nice landing. Oh. Like the rest of the 777 workforce, the flight test team had taken to the working together philosophy. It had been a revelation for one British engineer on the brakes team. It's worked very well with the supplier because I think that um, that traditionally is an area where things can get adversarial if you're not careful. And the supplier I worked with have worked with Boeing for a long time. And you develop a rut where you sort of tend to get very contractual if things aren't going exactly where everybody wants. And we were able, with some difficulty at first, it took quite a few months to really learn to trust each other, to get away from that contractual way of doing business, and to really start to see the other person's point of view, and to um, start to help each other. And it really uh, got better and better as the program's gone on. And I think we have a really fantastic relationship. We trust each other, we enjoy working together, and the dividing line between Boeing and the supplier it's sort of, it's not very visible, it's sort of merged. We're just working together as a big team, getting this project done. It's worked wonderfully well for us, it really has. The following morning in the cool dawn, the 777 set off for the big one. Rarely had a plane been put through the ordeal that this plane was about to experience. All stations, uh, 777 made its third stop at 06, 16, 12, at 3.17 miles and uh, we'll be taking the, run the runway and holding short. Car one copies. The test would have to demonstrate not only that the plane could stop before the end of the runway at maximum speed and thrust, but that it could also withstand the tremendous heat that would be generated in the brakes without catching fire. This test had been designed to reproduce the situation that faces a pilot when he has to brake with maximum force due to engine failure or an obstacle on the runway. The plane was at the maximum weight it would ever carry, laden with ballast to take it up to 288 tons. Cashman would accelerate the plane to a speed of 210 miles per hour and then apply the brakes with maximum force. Just to make the test even harsher, the brakes had been worn down to the minimum allowable thickness.
Halfway down the 15,000 foot runway, Cashman slammed on the brakes. As the plane traveled another 4,000 feet, the carbon disks and pads heated up to 3,000 degrees centigrade. was that after braking, the plane could stand or taxi for five minutes without catching fire. That was the estimated time it would take fire engines to reach the plane. During that time, Cashman and his crew would be sitting on a potential time bomb. As the plane taxied carefully back to the stand, several fire engines waited, counting the seconds until they could put out the flaming brakes and cool the wheels. Each tire had a fuse plug which melted at a certain temperature. Before the tires became so hot, they exploded. All 12 wheels were destroyed at a cost of three quarters of a million dollars. But the plane didn't catch fire and the brakes performed even better than expected. The test had put 9.7 million foot pounds of energy into the brakes and shown that the plane could survive almost intact. With the hardest test of strength behind it, the main challenge still facing the 777 was the testing of its endurance. Boeing had promised that the 777 would be the most reliable plane ever to go into service. Over the course of the next seven months, they would be called upon to prove it. <laughs> 